Human design is a part science, part spiritual system that tells you who you came here to be. You have your own blueprint, your own way of becoming successful, your own way your dreams are going to come true, the way you'll experience the most joy and fulfillment. The instruction manual for how to move through the world is custom to you. When you act according to that manual, when you act as the real you, everything in life comes to you with more ease and less resistance. We all know we're different, yet we're still acting like there's one way to do life. Let's talk about it. To find out your design and the designs of the people in your life, you can visit myhumandesign.com or download the My Human Design app in the App Store and on Google Play. Welcome back, everybody. I am so excited to share Marcus Weston with you again. If you've been listening for a while, you know that you came on in, I think it was March last year. Marcus, you were the first talk that I went to. I think I told you this. You're the first Kabbalah talk that I went to. It was about business and spirituality when I was extremely not open (laughs) to anything spiritual. And um, that was really sort of like the first uh, spark. And um, people just loved that episode so much. I don't know why it's taken me this long to get you back on. It's good. But thank you for being back. It's my pleasure. I love everything about you and everything you do. So it's a pleasure. Thank you. So we were talking about, um, you know, my audience loves diving into anything sort of anything Kabbalah related, anything mystical. And what I really love doing is asking the people that I'm close to. I only ever have people on that I know really well, like on this podcast. And I was kind of curious as to what's on your heart and your mind and what's top of mind and what shall we, what is it that people are interested in and what do we think they want to hear? And we've come up with this um, concept of talking about reincarnation because I think the reason why it's so helpful to know these things is because it kind of gives your life so much of a broader it just makes helps make sense of the tiny little blip that is you in this life as this soul so um can you just start by sharing what does kabbalah say about reincarnation on a on a sort of very basic level i guess the the summary is that everyone in the world has a purpose i think that's itself a very big subject Um, because people are clearly looking for purpose. I think it's a value of life that inspires and motivates and and promotes longevity. So everyone in life has a purpose. The Kabbalists add a timeline to that, meaning that you come back as many times as necessary to complete your purpose. And and of course, what's interesting about that, last time I know we had great fun talking about the ego, which is really my my kind of pet peeve and, and, and... definitely a passion point. (laughs) We always come back to the ego somehow. And I think really, in some sense, that's the what of life. Because you need, I think, to be successful to be, and again, success is how you find it, but in order to kind of live your life purpose and that lens of success, you, you, you want to have a grip and a hold over your ego. Because if you don't, of course, your ego has a grip and a hold over you. And I think that's the that's the what of life. And, and the great thing about Kabbalah, which I love, is it just keeps asking the question, why? And so in some sense, why is there a what? Right? Why is there a what? And, and of course, why is there a what to overcome? And, and one of the answers, which I think becomes compelling, is reincarnation, which probably if I ask you, do you believe in reincarnation? You might say yes, but then at some point, did you not believe in reincarnation and what turned your mind to believe in reincarnation? What was that? I'm interested. Not that I'm interrogating well, you, but I am interested. In those things as well. <laughs> you know, so you know that I was a total skeptic before Kabbalah. I was like just a scientist. You too? Yeah. <laughs> um, none of the rest really appealed to me. I thought it was a bunch of, you know, I don't know what I thought it was, but um So before Kabbalah, I never believed in reincarnation and I can't remember what order it was in, but I think it was at the end of your, either your Kabbalah two or your Kabbalah three at the time you did a past life meditation. You led people through a past life meditation and simultaneously around that same time, Ruth Nahmias, who I've spoken about um, on the podcast before, she's also a part of the Kabbalah Center in the UK, amazing astrologer if you are after a reading. 
we did a bunch of past life regressions together. And, you know, sometimes you think you make stuff up in your own head. But when someone else sees what you're seeing and tells it back to you before you've told them, that's when you go, okay, there's no way that I'm making this up. And I'd also had, I think a lot of people have reoccurring dreams, um, which I could never make sense of until I knew the context of why would a random of all the possible reoccurring dreams I could be having be Mm. mine? You know, why is this one the one I'm lumped with? And and in that context, it, it kind of makes all the sense yeah. in the world. Really. Yeah, I think that's really interesting. Especially, I, I think, your recurring dreams. I think that's fascinating. I think I think also from teaching classes, normally when, when you kind of come and talk about it through class and you ask the question, you know, who even believes in reincarnation? Probably 75% of the room put their hand up, which is quite interesting. Um, I, I, I find people connect geographically as well because i think sometimes there are countries or places where you know in the world that all the gates are open to you and somehow you walk into that place and you feel the floodgates open and every blessing and this flow state and abundance and prosperity and transcendence it just kind of dives and there are other parts of the world where it feels like someone's got their hands around your neck and, and a lot of people have those kinds of experience, which is interesting. It kind of builds a bit of evidence. In fact, there, there are some very interesting, apparently verified evidence of thousands of cases of, of children who seem to have knowledge of places and people and events of their past lives that's verified. And there's no way that they could know the detail. And even to the degree that many of those thousands of cases pinpoint injuries or or ways that that individual died and there were corresponding physical defects or birth marks on their own body. So there's lots of very interesting anecdotal evidence that I think Mm -hmm. begs you to be open at least or to say possibly, why not? So then why does Kabbalah say that reincarnating is necessary? And I guess tied to that is when does it cease to exist well, for that's a an person, interesting question. for a soul? So, so why, why is it necessary? Like we said, it, it's necessary because we have a job to do. And, and you have a job to do and you will not ever not be successful. It's like the universe's guarantee for you is that you will perfect your soul. It's, it's really the one thing that's clear in life is evolution, is, is transformation, is reinvention, because you cannot not change, right? You can avoid death and taxes wow. to some degree. Right? I mean, death <laughs> too, because biologically mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's already clear. Um, but transformation, change, you cannot not do. And so there seems to be some continuous process of life. And in fact, there's a very interesting Kabbalist who, who 500 years ago wrote about reincarnation. He wrote a very kind of thick book on all the details and mechanics of life and death and where the soul goes and reincarnation, what you come back as, which is crazy. And then, of course, how that catches birth and conception and, and that cycle. Very, very finite detail. And, and in it, he, he, he writes something really interesting. He says, imagine if, if in this life you're extremely wealthy, you're given the resource of, of, of wealth, and you abuse that resource. You don't help or share. Really, it's something that you consider y- yours. He says, what do you imagine that person, that soul will come back as next life? What do you think? Someone who gets abused by others or someone right. who ends up. So that's yeah. what you'd assume. What he writes mm. is that rich individual comes back even richer. Which is quite interesting because it begs the question, how, why, or how is that even fair? And, and one of the answers which, is, which, is, um, which explained is, is you have a job to do. 
And you have a finite mm. job. You have a finite amount of time. If you muck up that time, now you have much less time to do the same job. And of course, if you have half as much time to do the same job, you need to be twice as resourced. And that happens three times. The fourth time, if you consistently muck up, you come back as the subject of who you should have helped. And, and, and that <gasps> obviously begins a lesson. But it's so interesting to think that you would come back as, as rich. Because most people, I imagine, would say the same thing. It's like almost a justification mm. of, of, of negative activity is the consequence. But it's right. the exact opposite. Like the universe constantly gives us chances constantly mm. you know is almost kind of willing us to be successful in any shape or, or way and and of course the ego gets wow. in the way and can convolute that but but we have opportunities mm. that's amazing because it makes me wonder then i want to ask you does it make that person richer because it almost wants to concentrate the the task or make it even more acute to someone so that you can then it's like you can't yeah. avoid it or it makes you readdress it again. Yeah. But it, but it comes um, with, which makes it comes that with also... side effects. Because clearly the mm -hmm. more physicality you have, the, the, the deeper the imagination is, well, it's mine. And, and of course, mm. the proportionality of sharing with wealth diminishes with increased wealth. Wow. So, so wow. you know, normally kind of middle class people are the most sharing, right? The second you kind of climb mm. wealth ladders, proportionately becomes less. So it becomes more difficult to share. It's not easy to share. It's more difficult to share. That's so interesting because we um, did a podcast episode last week about how no one gets a free pass, right? Like everyone, no matter what you think you're trying to achieve, like it doesn't remove um, certain challenges from you and everything comes yeah. with a challenge. And I remember, I think it was you that said it the first time. And I think you were qu quoting someone else, but it came from you where you were saying that, you know, success, fame, money, all these things, they're magnifying glasses yeah. for your ego because actually if you don't check your ego, it just becomes even bigger. It, when you it's such an interesting things. spiritual concept because I think certainly people who hunt something spiritual, they, they have desires, they have dreams, they feel perhaps the world or their own lives should or can be more. And, and, and the, the irony in that is that it might be the greatest disaster for a person's life if their dreams came true. Because think about it. If, if you're someone who dreams of wealth, the acquisition of great, great wealth overnight could be your ultimate downfall because not many people can handle great wealth. I've seen more people suffer with wealth than prosper. Right. Same thing with a relationship might be that, you know, we beg and we pray and we we have desires towards a soulmate relationship. If you met your soulmate a year too early, you might ruin each other. Right. You might. And so it could be disastrous to achieve your dreams right now. And 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 it's just so interesting, that process of life about how you have to put focus on on your growth and your spiritual work and, and your output. We're obsessed by outcomes, I think, but we need to be more involved and perhaps obsessed with, with our output. <laughs> and that's what rewards, that's what carries and, and, and carries, um, um, you know, genuine cause and effect. Hmm. And I love that you have said in the same conversation, the success is guaranteed and also and at the same time, you can you can sort of rest in that knowing a little bit and you have to focus on your growth and you can't be the one who dictates what comes to you when and in yeah. what form and what there's, shape. There's a great Kabbalist who, who, who writes um, some hundreds of years ago about one of the, the ways to live. And he says, you need to wake up every morning and assume there's no system. There's no creation. There's no God. There's no universe. There's no cause and effect. There's no nothing. It's you <laughs> against the world. And you have to work and slog and give 120% fire to the creation of your every single day. Because if you don't, no one will. And at the end of your day, 
you would have created, you'd have energized yourself. Perhaps you've seen fruits and rewards. You have to sit back at the end of your day and you have to have absolute certainty that were you to have slept all day in your garage, the creator would have given you those same fruits and it had nothing to do with you whatsoever. It was nothing to do with you whatsoever. Wow. And of course, that, that is a contradiction for most people. But, but when you master both those strings to your bow, you are on fire spiritually because you're victim to nothing and you have certainty in your process. And that's probably the sweet spot where there's very, very little, certainly a far diminished sense of pain and suffering. Wow. And, you know, I think surrender is such a concept that is thrown around so much, but it's so misunderstood. But as I'm hearing you say this, I'm like, this is what it is. Like, it's this. It's it's not giving up and doing yeah. nothing because that is the transformation of you and that's the thing that you need to be in charge of. And yet all the outside thing is like, we just need to not think that we're yeah. in charge of that. I, I, I see all. that. I'm sure you see that. Um, people, people abuse the spiritual I mean I think probably that's the the ego's job is probably to weaponize spiritual truths. Right? <laughs> probably. And and I think one of the weaponized spiritual truths is is as you say surrender because people use it as an excuse for laziness and and passivity and the wrongful acceptance of something that they could invest and involve themselves to create change in. And, and I think that's probably, in fact, there's a very interesting, and this is a bit controversial, but we like that. Um, but there's, a, there's a Kabbalist, mm -hmm. um, again, uh, some hundreds of years ago, and, and he, he writes in, in one, of his, one of his books called the, the Gates of Holiness, he writes that there is a tikkun, which means there is a life issue that many of us experience sometimes chronically, but, but most people um, in some level cyclically depression mm -hmm. right i think everyone even if you're a very motivated inspired disciplined person you have moments when you just feel not on perhaps sad mm -hmm. perhaps depressed and of course that can go quite deep but he says what's one of the spiritual roots of sadness and depression and this again sounds controversial certainly i don't mean it to be but i hope if you give me a minute to explain it it, it, it has some truth to it and of course if this initial spiritual point is missed it can go so deep that then, yes, there's a genuine issue that needs physical support. He says spiritually, mm -hmm. if you catch it early enough, one of the roots of sadness and depression is laziness. And, and that sounds a bit mm -hmm. harsh, but, but the idea is what's the source of your soul? What's the source of happiness it's inside your soul? You, you, you have happiness brewing inside of you. And if your body is aligned mm -hmm. with your soul, which means you're really truly understanding and doing your spiritual work, of course, you, you have affinity with your soul, which means you feel that light and fire of happiness and joy and fulfillment, even in the darkest times. But of course, if you're lazy and you're not aligned with your soul, then you feel the lack of your soul, which is the lack of happiness. Now, the question, of course, is can you be hyperactive and spiritually lazy? And the answer is absolutely yes. Because you can mm -hmm. be very busy occupying yourselves with the wrong thing, avoiding the thing that you know you should be doing. Yeah, it's like a, it's a not not a laziness related to not necessarily solely related to how much action you're taking, but right, aligned exactly. action and honoring of the part of your path and the work that's actually in front of you instead of may maybe telling ourselves we, we do this as well we yeah. either sit back and do nothing or we tell ourselves it's this other thing that's the most important thing yeah. i need to yeah. focus on and it's not i think, I think it's why they kind of say probably the most important thing that one can choose in life is environment because you, you need to be around jenners and and people who who can inspire you who can check you who can smoke out issues who can lift you in those in those down moments and, and who mm. can just give you sounding boards to what you think are genius, great ideas that really might not be. Mm -hmm. and, and who <laughs> you surround yourself with becomes really the greatest asset of life, possibly. Well, it's funny that you say that because I remember one of the things in your Kabbalah one. I don't know if I don't remember if it's in everyone's. I've taken a few, but I remember in your Kabbalah one, I believe it's like a, very, a lesson very early on about how 
you should reach out to a few people and ask them things that they think you yeah. need to work on. Full confession, I never did it back then. <laughs> Cause you know what? I swear to you, I mean, 23, I, 24 year old me is like ter- terrified it, it to hear that. It is terrifying, it is terrifying. But, but now I actively, with the few people that I trust, I actively ask, cause you can be friends or close to the most wise seer in the world. But unless you're asking, I've learned that, yeah. like you actually need to, to seek the- Yeah, and, and by the, 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 the next level of that, is is to ask people who you don't have full trust with because there's kind of all of us have an intimate circle where i think as one of my teachers say the person that could put you in prison because they know everything about you right all your kind of (laughs) deepest darkest thoughts and those people of course you're trust and you're open with and there's no issue in vulnerability but there's people out there who judge you and you know who judge you and some of those people might have deeper truths about you than your best friends who will cover or cushion most of the messages, um, possibly. Yeah. Well, you know, I say this to, I don't know if I told you this, but me and um, some of the ladies that I work with, we spoke about a couple months ago, we were like, who are the people who really you could say that one session with them or one conversation with them really move the needle on your life. And, you know, you come up Mm. in that conversation all the time because, and this I've really learned as a sort of, and we spoke about this in our session when, when you did one for me, however many years ago that was about people pleasing and how that's ego. That's Mm. a big topic, but how actually kindness is the honesty. And that was something that was modeled to me by you before I kind of intellectually understood that is that it's sometimes the the person that's gonna tell you something that you're not gonna like, who's not gonna be like, they're there, you're amazing, the whole world's against you, you're a victim. That actually is not that helpful when we're, if we really care about someone's growth. Yeah, I, 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 I try and hone half an hour sessions where you can just really, um, get to very deep truths. And I think the reason comes back to why we're talking, why I feel sometimes that that comes to me is because my own ego has seen such a full spectrum of, of, of pain and insecurity and fear and, and inhibition and voicelessness and, and, and just so many facets of ego that I've seen growing up through the various cycles of my own life. And at the time, of course, you feel less than and you feel inadequate and you feel always wanting. But, but now looking back, there's no way, there's no way that I could ever help anyone without each of those micro experiences. And, and it's so funny, someone interviewed me recently and said, you know, when you go back 50 years and what would you tell your younger self and how would you change? And, and, I, and I, there's, no, there's no way in hell I would change anything. I mean, what, what, what a, it's almost a silly question. It's like, how could you take out the training to a, a, a talent that you have? You, you can't have the talent without the training. And, and, and every single second wow. the universe is training and you just have to have conviction that, that it's like in the gym. Why, why is the gym should be a very painful, stupid experience. It should be, <laughs> but, but because you have absolute certainty in the outcome, you accept the pain and you actually mm. enjoy the pain. And in fact, without the pain, it's useless. You pay for the pain. You pay for the pain. Mm. Same thing in life. If you had that same certainty, if you knew that every single second was just a training ground for some expertise, some experience, some greatness, some majesty, some profession of some place to help millions of people potentially. I mean, you, you tell mm. yourself, I can handle more pain. Please, more pain now. Because I buy into the fruit in 10 years time. So. That's really, really such an easy analogy when you put it that way. Because if you have certainty of the outcome, you would feel the exact same way. So then my question is, the, if the universe cares so deeply about all of us and it's sending us all this exact perfect training for us individually, how do we make sure in our consciousness that we make it? that we make the most of this training versus, you know, you do see people who live life and the training passes us by. 
it's it's you could have you couldn't have contrived a better question um, because the answer that, that my teacher gave many many years ago is you need to know past life and 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 of course that sounds a bit theoretical but let me explain think about the challenges that all of us go through all of us I mean honestly if, if life was random there should be some people in the world who are without challenge if life was truly not by co if was by coincidence there should be a, a certain sector of people that that are, are are living chaos free that's not true every one of us has people and places and relationships and business and finances and pains and various things that that that, that in bizarre ways unite us if you experience a challenge faced with that slither of reality there is a justice that each person wants because I've been wronged. I've been wronged. And so, of course, you, you create a reaction to this injustice. And, of course, that's the right thing to do. But, but if you understand reincarnation, possibly, and I'm not saying this is always the case, but possibly, there is such a reason for what you're going through right now. Right? Imagine the conscious we have is, is, is often not in perfect place, which means sometimes our consciousness pollutes our environment. So in some sense, we have a, a debt to nature and nature bites back always. So, so imagine if there's a bite back to something previous that you're unaware of. And this particular sliver of challenge is the payment of a debt from your past, either a year ago or a lifetime ago, it matters not. Just the introspection and the lessening of that moment to ask yourself mm. why was this in my movie how can i learn either to not attract such chaos or such idiots how can i learn to grow myself and what can i do about that what can i learn what can i do that might be the payoff of an entire past life debt as opposed to wow. the slither of reality where your ego will tell you you need to stand up for yourself which I'm not saying is a bad thing in many ways, but mm -hmm. it can be the wrong thing to do sometimes. And so, right. So, yeah. So it depends on the context of why this is happening to you. For someone, it might be that they have to stand up and someone else might just be to exactly. let the pain move and, and, through them. And what happens in life is you double up on chaos if you get it wrong. Why? Because let's say <laughs> the universe sends you a particular challenge. That's one thing to correct. That's one thing to handle. If you overreact to that challenge, not just does that challenge have to come back to you in your future sometime, but you've planted now a new seed of overreaction that also has to come back to you. So when you get these moments wrong, you're actually doubling up potentially on the chaos in your future, which is so unnecessary. Equally, if you get it right, mm -hmm. You can remove chaos from your life. You can change your destiny. You can lift yourself through a higher plane of consciousness because you now don't need that recurring chaos. That groundhog day has been removed because you live on a higher plane where that chaos now can't find you because you're beyond it. That's incredible. It's really interesting as well to, I think, parents and, and the question of why you choose your parents is a really interesting mm subject in reincarnation i find and of course again it's a slither where you just look at the fact that look at your mum and look at your dad and and some people just think i mean there's no way i would choose these people <laughs> i mean disaster and some people you know clearly chose very well but there's a really interesting question the capitalists ask in reincarnation why did you choose your parents and it points to your purpose. You know, why specifically did you choose your mother? And why specifically did you choose your father? And more importantly, why did your mother choose you, your soul? And why did your father choose you? It's four really tricky questions to ask and answer sometimes. But wow, there's deep process there. Yeah. And there's probably multiple, multiple reasons. And it's like you slot in perfectly together, right? Like I'm getting so many more things. You get the blessings and you also get the, the help with the 
overcoming your own right. self through both. And is it the same way the other way around? Like that's what you do for your parents? So, so normally when we run these kinds of workshops, I find it's more difficult for people to answer why my parents chose me. Yeah. Because most people, even as you say in chaotic parent situations, might eventually through experience in their latter years appreciate, you know, my father's lot. And that was the best he could be kind of thing. But I think self-value, self-love is such an issue globally. And so the question is, why would my parents choose me specifically, me, uniquely me? It's not an easy one to answer. No. And, and how do they choose you? Do they choose you when they conceive you? Do they choose you before they come here themselves? Is it decided how many kids you're going to have? <laughs> so it's funny, if, if you know Ruth and perhaps you with human design as well, I mean, definitely... You know, Ruth, I know, can see it in a chart, right? You have two kids waiting for you. You have three kids waiting for you, right? Which is kind of a bit scary, depending on where you're at. I, I, I think, again, going back to some of the, the, the old Kabbalistic writings, there, there is a spark where the consciousness of conceiving parents marries synchronizes with the light of a reincarnating soul so if you imagine mm. the, the again this is this again perhaps a bit too graphic but 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 the importance of your consciousness and conception is everything i mean is everything because it's a vessel wow so if you're thinking about yourself or your neighbor or you know, whatever it may be <laughs> um, it's actually spiritually, I wouldn't say dangerous because it sounds too scary, but, but it has an effect. But if you're thinking about right. sharing and giving and love and unity and, and that connection, that is a huge vessel that will pull on a much bigger light, a bigger soul that has a bigger job. That's really interesting. I, my brain is going off into a direction of, I'm just wondering how, you know, how you were saying about the ego is being tasked with sort of, you know, um, ruining or, or misdirecting us in terms of, you know, spiritual platitudes and stuff. I wonder also how much then all the conditioning around intercourse is is messing this up and, and to what degree is it making people perhaps have challenges with with giving birth because i mean it seems like on an energetic level this would really help if you're if you're wanting to conceive obviously we know that the brain and thoughts have an effect on on yeah. physical reality right that of course maybe your ovaries would be more willing yeah. to play or you know be part of get on board with the with the mission and yeah. stuff and um yeah i mean it's interesting how i've just never how thought about that before. clearly 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 associated to that the consciousness, I, I, there's a very good friend of ours who, who lived her whole life with very, very, very deep self-esteem issues to the degree where she would think, you know, what's the point of me? What's the purpose of me? I don't belong anywhere. I don't feel anything. I'm numb. There's no point to me. And, and, and the river ran very deep with her. She called the time, this is going back many years, my teacher, Karen Berg. And Karen just immediately told her, call your father. It's your father. Call your father. So she called her father and had a long chat. Now, the story is interesting. Her father and her mother uh, divorced. But her father told her something she never knew, which is that before she was born, he chose to leave her, the mother. And, and was in a very tricky place and said, I'm done. I'm really done. I'm out. And then her mother got pregnant. And his consciousness was, I don't want this. This is the last thing in the world that I want. I mean, I would wish this would, right? And he did perhaps the decent thing and they stayed together a year or two and then the inevitable happened. But but she lived with that consciousness her whole life and now has managed to kind of work mm. through it. But but mm. I'm saying the consciousness of your parents in conception through birth, through birth, it, yeah. it's it's building your belief systems. Yeah. 
Now play wow. that back. And it's an interesting question as well, by that. But, but the question is also, how old are you? And you might answer you're 25 or whatever you are. Um, <laughs> I'm 37, Marcus. Ish. So how old were you a day before you were born? Well, I wasn't. But, but were you alive? Yes, I was. Were you alive a month hmm. before you were born? Were you alive six months before you were born? Were you alive eight months before you were born? I, I don't actually know biologically. Mm. But where were you? Who were you? What were you? Is it reasonable to think that the most extraordinary soul, which every single one of us is, able to change the world? Most people who truly find greatness in life are, are, are often those who live horrible lives, who have known such depths of pain that they find the extremity of value because of that push. Is it possible right. that someone in so much chaos can just come from nothing? I mean, how is that scientifically explained? I'm sure there are, and I'm sure that might be an interesting debate, but, but I don't think it's unreasonable to think that there is the magnificence of your soul that just pops in and continues its journey. It's, it's, it's almost inconceivable to me that, that just a cell mm. could reproduce and build every one of our majestic lives. And, and if that's ca the case, why can't we just keep that going? Why can't I just fly right now? Why can't I just be myself to Ibiza? Mm. Why is that not still possible? Yeah. And so there are so many spiritual principles, I think, that, that begin to make sense. And, and nothing is there. I mean, the great thing about Kabbalah is you haven't got to believe in reincarnation to, 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 to begin to, uh, uh, to look at life. You haven't got to believe in anything because ultimately what you have to deal with is in front of you. And whether it comes from five years ago or past lives matters not. But mm. it's good to be curious. It's great to also understand how you're supposed to deal with a situation that maybe someone else would, it would be correct for them to deal with it in a different way. And so it's almost like your own manual. And, you know, that's kind of what human design is all about is, is your own manual to life. But from the that mystical side of things of, oh, I have a tendency to do this. So the person that tends to do the opposite is not going to be the medicine for me. And that is kind of where it does help to know the context of like what your soul's been through before, what it needs to change, why it came here again, because it's not going to come here for no yeah. reason. It's the universe doesn't waste energy yeah. like that, right? So there's a very, um, there's a very, how... very old story, which uh, Karen used to tell. It's actually written again in one of the kind of old, old Kabbalah books. It says, the student comes to his teacher and he says, life is horrible. Life makes no sense. Life is full of injustice. And, and he was asked by his teacher to go and sit in the park and just wait and observe life. And sure enough, after some hours, a man walked along, sat on the bench with a big, big um, bag of, of cash in it. And all of a sudden something happens and he, and he runs off out of the park and leaves the bag of cash there. In walks the second man, sits down randomly on this bench and looks down and sees this bag of cash, thinks his, his lucky day has happened, and he runs off with the cash. And then a third man comes in and sits down randomly and innocently. The first man comes back. And he, he, he says to the, the, the third guy, where's my bag? The guy says, I haven't got a clue what you're talking about. And, and the first guy beats up the third guy. And so the student goes back to his teacher and he says, I, now I know that life is random, chaotic, and horrible, and there's no purpose to nothing. And, and his teacher <laughs> says, you have eyes, but you don't see them. You have ears, but you can't hear. What happened was the first guy stole from the second guy in a previous life. So what looks to be a random situation was an adjustment. So the guy says, well, what about the third guy? He got beaten up. And, and the teacher said he was the judge that wrongly ruled in the past life against the, um, the wrong party. And, and again, it's just an interesting story to explain that there are things that just will not make sense in the slither mm. or slice of, of physical reality. But once your consciousness understands the bigger nature of time, you'll start to put together the cause and effect of life. And that's really where great value begins. So for you, because obviously I, I do really believe that there are some people who can see the cogs and 
for you, someone who's been practicing this for such a long time, is there a way that you know when something, a challenge comes to you? Like, do I just let it, is this one of those ones that I kind of let it pass and don't try to find the meaning? And when is it important for That's me to It's a great question meaning? because you can obsess yourself with that concept of why, of why, of why this is in my movie and drive yourself nuts. It's a real question. I, I think, I think some sensible filtering is necessary where you begin to evidence major events and and a major event might be something which is insignificant outside of you but very significant inside of you right it could be that you're in a party and someone just you know reels off a joke and no one thinks twice but from your point of view it's it's hurt it's dug very deep and it really was uh was was painful and you can't let go of it so that's a major event it's something internally mm. major and i think what happens in life is you start mm. to put through internal major events through a funnel and to those questions you ask why was that in my movie i think you'll start to evidence repetition and where the mm. universe keeps knocking on your door with the same message through different environments same message from okay. business, same message from wife, same message from kids, same message from friends, same message from family, same message from a texture, same message from strangers, same message from watching a movie on TV. It, you, you, you got to start to listen. You got mm. to start to listen because if, if you're avoiding those kinds of messages, I think that's when chaos ramps up. And, and, and again, you know, let, let's give context to that briefly. What is the universe's guarantee of your fulfillment and perfection? Pain and suffering. Because you will never go too far out of the pathway of where you need to get to. It's like a cattle, an electrified cattle fence. You know, you got to keep going down the path. And if you slither off too far, that electric is going to bump you back on track. And it will I, I, I horribly, perfectly, you could say, that's actually how we stay on track because chaos wakes us up. It awakens us. There's no chaos for chaos sake. Chaos is for the sake of awakening. Beautiful. That really does make me think that um, it's almost the same themes that repeat and repeat and repeat. And even if sometimes even if you've overcome it to one level, you think you're never going to have it again. And you're like this one, right. another area, like got to deal with this. It's, it's almost like the cool thing about your tacoon. And maybe you'll correct me if I'm wrong. Maybe I've misunderstood this, but it's always kind of the same lot that you're tasked with. So it's not all of a sudden that you're going to have a separate issue that you've never felt um, or that was never coming to you. Cause I guess what you're saying about, you know, sometimes with success, you could have to learn different things, like different situations or bring out different yeah. parts of the, um, things you have to overcome, but it's, it's, you're, you go into the, the real, like those deep, long pain points, you have to kind of like unpick them in different from different angles as you go. It's not, it's never, I don't think it's ever like a one and done yeah. thing. Yeah, this is a, you, you kind of, you, you often win life on points, not knockout. It's that kind of mm. chipping away and, and it sounds tedious, but actually the, the process is what allows you to feel everything. You don't have to get everywhere to feel everything. You just need to be on the way to every thing to feel everything. There's a real piece in that, in that, that you're never there because, you know, and I think it came from you or it maybe came from Karen that, you know, that is the last day of your life that you, that you feel that. So if we're going to suffer if we think we need to be there every day on the way. Right. right. And I think that it's such a big fear, isn't it? Like if you look at a lot of the fears that people live with through life, a lot of it roots back to the fear of death. Mm. And, and, and I tell you, I've, I've had the fear of death, um, uh, having mourned uh, a family member, 
for years, for years and years, and try to chip away at it. And it's a big, big chunk that doesn't move slowly. And I must say, having got out of that rut called the fear of death, I now am in this really tricky place called the fear of old age. I, 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 I have this fear of, of when you just can't do what you know you're supposed to do. You know, now's mm. fine because I think it's funny because most people wish they were younger. I, I don't. I mean, I really don't. Because I think there's a kind of cross section where when you're young, you're very able, but you're not so wise. And when you're very old, you're super wise, but you're not able. And there's a midpoint, there's a crossover where you're super able and super wise. And you want to try and extend that for as long as possible. I think that's not even 40s. I think that's more 50s, 60s. Um, uh, that's maybe why they say happiness begins yeah. at 50s, because you've got so much that you haven't got to worry about, perhaps in your 20s, when you're hunting for some meaning, identity, and wealth, and you've got a few kids, and you park that boat, and you can just go on and start living. I believe that's why yeah. happiness begins at 50s. And but the fear of not being able, the fear of being physically mm. less energetic, mm -hmm. you know, illness. I think that is, uh, I, I feel that for myself. Um, uh, yeah. It makes me think that what we don't fear is death. It's yeah. not fully living. It's getting to that way, point 100%. and being, you know, when our soul meets with the light again and it says, okay, did you... Did you make yourself proud? Did you say what you wanted to do? And I don't think any of us want to say, I thought this was a dress rehearsal and I didn't take right. it seriously. And Yeah, and I think, I think certainly Kabbalistically, when, when you look at death, which, which sounds like a very morbid subject, I found, I found life, depth and value of life by understanding the Kabbalistic view of death in that the soul continues, right? The person is not gone. The, the person, the real person, you know, you know, the person you love is the spirit, the soul, the energy. It's not the body because that goes south anyway. It's the person, the soul, the, right? Because so, so that person who you love, that's the person that lives on. That's what reincarnates and goes through and back and so on. So as you say, at point of death, the soul realizes, oh, there's no death. There's life, only life. But what you said is so powerful that the real pain is not death then, it's that kind of, the, 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 the sometimes long lived moments before where you feel that you can't really live, but you're alive. Yeah. It makes me wanna ask you, how does it work then when once you do pass and you choose or it's decreed that you have to come back or decide to come back, what's the difference? I'm sure you get this question in your in that class. You know, when you kind of people say, Oh, I feel my grandmother around, or you know, oh, it's the spirit of someone, or it's a it's the ghost or whatever the thing is. How does that work? And can someone be reincarnated and also have remnants of themselves or their soul hmm. kind of non-physically present? It's, it's, it's similar to us right now, right? So we're in metaphorically a studio, but a million people could be watching this in their living rooms. So you, Jenna, appear in a million people's living rooms, even though you physically are in a studio. So imagine this, right? This is a really kind of interesting thought. Imagine that your grandchild from a previous life had a very lovely connection with you because it often happens, grandparents and grandkids, right? So you're, in your past life, your, your grandchild loved you. I mean, idolized you and and always thinks about you because you touched his or her life so deeply. And on your anniversary, or perhaps even randomly, that grandchild lights a candle for your soul. As a memory, as a courtesy. 
your day is going to be fantastic. Because the soul that he's lighting that candle for, or meditating or praying for, carries through from its root to your physical branch called your current life. And you benefit from that effort that he's made. Now, he might be 80 years old. <laughs> but your life will have an amazing day because suddenly someone's done that for you, as in his grandmother, your past life. <laughs> There's an interesting thought. Wow. That actually, by the way, that really makes me think of, you know, when you're a kid and it's like, go do this for your right. grandma, go do this for your grandpa. It makes me think, wow, that really does matter. And even when yeah. they're not here, you know, yes. give them energy 100%. somehow. And, and sometimes you have this day where you're in a, you have, you know, a difficult zone. You just have one day where you just feel some reprieve and it's like you get a moment and you feel the point again and, and then you're back on the slog and maybe that's one of the reasons like there's that cycle of, of life and you know what this comes back to as you're saying that is is always yeah. sharing because the more you you know the more you know you can always yeah. do and, and and it also points to again it's interesting thing because if you've experienced bereavement before i mean from someone truly close it's it's a black hole it's not like just someone not being around anymore it, it's a black hole. Why is it so dark and dismal and, 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 and mm. just debilitating? And, and one of the answers the Kabbalists give, which, which I think just gives life to the whole process again, it, kind of, it, 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 it rehabilitated me, I can tell you, is imagine the person you love clearly is someone who's given you everything, given you so much. That's why you feel such a connection to them. So throughout their lives, they've given to you, they've looked after you, they've loved you, they've connected you, they've supported you, they've sacrificed for you, they've done everything they can for you and beyond what you know, they've done much more and all the rest of it. And so every time a person helps you out, they give you a piece of their soul. They give you a spark of themselves. And so that's why we have thoughts of our parents and belief systems, which we inherit. And there's something hereditary comes because in some sense, we've been invested in so thoroughly by our parents, possibly. So part of our makeup, spiritually, energetically, sparks of our parents' soul, sparks of this loved one who we're mourning. When they go, when their soul elevates, they take all of them with them. So everything that was you, that was so attached to, in love with, and a part of them, leaves you. Goes. Leaves you. It's not just someone saying, I will never see you again. I love you and goodbye. It, 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 you're, you're, you're empty. There's nothing left of you almost. If you have a really difficult mourning process, I'm saying. Why? Because they've taken all of them with themselves. Now, what's the spiritual perfection and beauty of that? Beauty of that. The Kabbalists say that, that really what elevates the soul is the body. And that's a bigger subject, but really the transformation of the body and the physical process that the body creates is the engine that allows the soul to elevate. When the soul is upstairs by itself, has no body, can't elevate. Mm. It needs us. When you're mourning, you can't do anything but think about mourning. If you won the lottery tomorrow, you'd be tremendously happy and then within a couple of days, you still be happy, but lots of other things would, would, would be a part of that happiness. When you're mourning, nothing means nothing. Nothing matters. No bill matters. No best friend calling you matters. Nothing matters. All you have is the lack and loss. Why? Because the soul that's elevated needs you. Needs you to think of them. Needs you to share for them. Needs you to do things in their name as if they were doing it physically to help their soul elevate. And the beauty is, as you begin to catch on to that, to light a candle for them, to share in their name, to go through every day thinking, well, this is an action of sharing. That light I create, I, I give, I dedicate to this soul. The restriction, the overcoming, this, this kind of overcoming right now is a light I give to the soul. So the more that you do for the soul is the light of sharing you create that has affinity with the soul that has left to bring them back to you. And that's how you feel them again. That's how you know they're there again, because you've actually helped them elevate 
which has created this new line of communication, this new affinity with their soul, which is the only thing that can heal you when you get them back. Wow. You know, that's saying it's like horrible conversations and subjects, but life-giving, life-giving, I think, depending on, you know, how you grieve or it's part of that reincarnation. Mm. And I guess that's why there's so many religions and so many belief systems and, you know, Kabbalah, whatever, whatever we call that, a modality um, that have these processes that tell you how you can, you know, that ensure that even if maybe you don't understand this, that you do in some way give back and that you do have ritual and devotion and dedication. Yeah. Um, and it does help. It does make yeah. you feel slightly better. Yeah. But with the consciousness, it makes all yeah. the difference as well. Yeah, I, I think it's life giving. I think it's life. It really is. Yeah. It really is. That's that's what we're all here talking about. Anytime we're talking about anything, is the 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 business right. of life <laughs> and how yeah. to live it. Yeah. <laughs> and I think honestly, I really do think that you know, me knowing my my cluster of people that are here listening. You know, I really feel that everybody doesn't want this to go by without doing the thing that they came here to do. And it, like you said, it's not the wealth. It's not the thing. It's not the it's the really like becoming of self. And that kind of I've taken so much of your time. But just to close up, I was going to ask you, like, you know, we all have a purpose. And I think sometimes is it that we get too narrow where, yes, maybe your purpose in this life might have just been to stay sober. But maybe if you tick that off the list, there's always another, like, are we always all going towards achieving 100% of every single vector in life? Like, for our soul, there's obviously more to, like, if you just, if you um, achieve one side of success in something, that's not where it ends for anyone, is there? There's always, you can always be everything. Is that correct? Yeah, in some sense. It's interesting because this is the month of cancer. And there's a, a, a fascinating lesson in this month where it says 4,000 years ago in one of the Kabbalah books, the point of this month is, is, is the power of eyes, the power of your eyes, which means to... They're going to rejuvenate or renew your eyes where you can see just goodness, which sounds a bit crazy or perhaps even unsafe, but but actually everything would come from that. Clearly, if if each one of us is doing our spiritual work, you you become a light that shines so bright that others' negativity is no longer visible to you. Right? And that, that's the vector. And yes, maybe it has lots of pieces of the puzzle and maybe you get so far. And, but, but you want to reach that point where it's a beautiful metric to even audit yourself every day with. You know, are you in the place where, where almost all you can see is goodness? Almost all you can see is goodness. The other's darkness is no longer visible to you because the light doesn't understand darkness. The light can't see darkness. <laughs> there's... there's there's nothing there, right? That's when you know that you're peaking in your spiritual practice. Yeah, so it's, it's um, you know, Kabbalah, I mean, if you haven't taken Kabbalah one, definitely. When do you have your next one coming up? Um, my next Kabbalah one, I'm not sure. But, um, uh, you know, it'll be posted at some point. I'm not sure. But it's, it reminds me of like lesson number one is like the whole reason of the whole point where's, where are we aiming towards is to become like the light yeah. and to cleave ourselves to all the qualities that the light has. So I guess that's what, that's a redefinition of succeeding is not, like you said, it's not about maybe that could be the worst thing that happened to you is being even more wealthy, right? Because you, maybe. whatever. Um, or maybe it is being with a long-term relationship because you had a history of staying or whatever. But um, are we all supposed to, have more like if if our soul feels like i'm destined for more is that ever wrong yeah it's never wrong but the question is more what i think that's yeah. where the ego can infiltrate the soul says yes right. i'm destined for more more light more connection more 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 love more excitement more joy more more 
you know, all the positive traits that the light represents. Yeah. The ego then will play us for that desire. Mm. Validation, shiny yes. carrots. Yeah. 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 All of that. But all the ultimate place, and I think it's an interesting spiritual question as well, the question of desire, because some people think that to have no desire is the ultimate connection. The Kabbalists say, and it's not a contradiction, to have the biggest desire, the biggest desire to receive is the ultimate place. Because if your heart is pure, you will want to share and change the world. And if your heart is pure, receiving to you is giving. In fact, if you're, if you're on such a high level, there is no receiving. Receiving is giving because the action of receiving is equal to the immediate deployment of resource to help others. And so wow. if your heart is pure, then suddenly you should have a shameless desire to receive. Shameless. <laughs> we should each want to receive shamelessly. Because the only guilt is when I'm in the way. So if there's no me in the way, if it really is about, if someone came in and said, Marcus, I got 10 billion pounds, not sure what to do. Within a second, I could deploy it to change the world, to give consciousness to 8 billion people, remove pain, suffering, and death instantaneously. There's no shame to receive that because it's not about me. Mm, you'd be like, give it to me. <laughs> I think people have an issue in receiving for that reason. Because we're worried about getting in the way of the People sharing. People have it. an issue with what me is, and so they diminish themselves, and so can't receive, and so they keep themselves sharing, which is a false decoy to remove what they really need, right? Which is to expand their capacity of value and their ability to receive. And, and I think all of us are so sharing. Everyone's up earlier and in bed later and doing more things in their day than they probably want. Every one of us is sharing much more than we think all day. Biggest problem is mm -hmm. we're not so understanding or able to receive. And there's a whole, there's lots of secrets to that, but that that's for another episode. <laughs> for another episode. And we'll, we'll, I promise everyone who's listening, it will be less than 15 months until you're back. But also in the meantime, on, on the website, you do have a lot of recorded courses. And, you know, if you want to go deeper on any of these topics, where else, yeah. where else can people? Instagram yep. is always the easiest contact. Um, that's the only social I have. I am Marcus Weston. Um, and just message or, or, or there's a bunch of videos there. And there's always courses and seminars and Globally, like I say, I'll be in Australia in a few weeks, in the Philippines, um, and then Dubai, and I'll be all over in the next month or so. So, yeah. Thank, Thank you. Thank you so you. much for being here. This was so much fun. I hope you're the go best on person hours. with the best platform, Jenna. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. <laughs>